During the 90s, the Stephen King miniseries was an event. It's hard to quantify if streaming was your gateway into television, but King was, well, a king during this peak in the 90s. And when we got a long form version of his stories, you sat down and watched. So as the weather gets colder and the big snowstorm lingers off of the horizon, I'd like to revisit one of King's best stories, one with heart, soul, and regret, and one made specifically for television. So let's head back to the island and make a choice no one should have to make. This is Storm of the Century. Nice hearing from you, Carlos. And the last miniseries King had in the 90s was, in my humble opinion, the best of its time. Set on a little tall island in 1989, Storm the Century tells the tale of a small fishing community that became isolated during a ravenous snowstorm. Only finding shelter isn't the only worry. A man with extraordinary powers and a grim request shows up changing the course of every life on that island. If you haven't seen it, I'd come back to this video after. You gotta trust me, it is worth the wait. So of course, spoilers ahead for the rest. Airing as a three-part miniseries on ABC in February of 1999, Storm of the Century revolves around a handful of island members to flesh out its story. But the focal point and the story's hero is Mike Anderson, played by Joe Hackett himself, the always excellent Tim Daly. As the storm grows and its seriousness becomes apparent, Andre Linoge awaits his capture after murdering sweet old Martha Clarendon. A man on a mission, a man with a request. Give me what I want and I'll go away. Something that I've always appreciated about this story is how Linoge plays the long game. Linoge kills Martha and waits, knowing he'll be caught. He sits patiently in jail as he murders other residents, forcing them to commit suicide leaving his message to be seen by all. Every single thing Linoj does is in service of getting his preferred outcome. It's a slow build that at closer inspection is the building blocks of another worldly being's master plan. Linoj can take his time. He must. If he reveals himself too early, the town may be too frightened to act. Or it may do the opposite. It could bond them with the common goal of fighting evil. Linoj thoughtfully plants the seeds of doubt, shame, and fear. He lets his powers be known slowly and for all to see. Once Mike and pal Hatch, played by Jerry Mitchell himself, Casey Shimashko, can't get Linoj into the back entrance of the town's makeshift jail, which is awkwardly located at the back of the supermarket, a eh, small town. They must go through the busy front. He begins to spout the dirty secrets of the townsfolk, causing a silent panic while also making sure the others will talk. He's slowly pushing them into place, yet murder a few so they know he means business, and reveal deep and intimate info so that if the threat of violence doesn't shake you, your checkered past becoming public will. The island can keep a secret, and though most of the darkness may be peripheral to everyone, it's a smile and mind your own business life. Linoj chose this place to ask for his favor. Because these people are flawed, they have something to lose. So by the time he reveals his ask, Give me what I want, and give it freely, and I'll go away. You've already made up your mind. You just haven't realized it yet. Call him Fjord. As Andre Linoj gives an iconic performance, playing respectful with a you know, pinch of upper class, yet has the intensity of a cold-blooded killer. All he asks is for a simple favor. Give me what I want and I'll go away. Tim Daly plays the Everman Mike with a kind and morally strong demeanor. From his stance on not killing what he knows to be conceptually evil, to begging the town to reconsider on Linoj's ask, Daly gives Mike a true sense of self and plays off Fjord with ease. Now, I'll be honest, it's been a while since I've seen a, a morally good character and enjoyed something that isn't as fashionable as it once was. You also have the great Jeffrey DeMond chewing the scenery as the slimy town manager, a broken, forced murderer. Katrina Withers, played by Julie Nicholson. Deborah Ferentino stands tall above the rest as Molly, a mother who eventually loses everything 
And I'm not saying everyone in this hits, as you know, some line readings are corny and what may sound great on page doesn't always sound as great on screen. But with that in mind, a 90s TV miniseries will never be at the level of something like True Detective or The Outsider. But Storm of the Century is one of the ones of its era that goes for broke. And King was able to get in some dark commentary on the willingness that a smile and a handshake can forgive some deeper troubles. A murder, a hate crime, screwing over work and friends. Hell, even the abortion angle seems a bit dark for ABC in the late 90s, but all this gives a real credence to the story. Yet it's never so black and white. Mike is either aware of some of the things that Leno spilled out, or he purposely turns the other way because eh, life is messy. Yet it's the age-old saying, we either live together or die alone. Is it worth everyone dying on principle or losing one to save many? And having Linoge not only bound by some set of rules that eh, do seem slightly fair, but have him conduct his plan as more of a necessary evil, one that he doesn't derive much pleasure from, make this tale far more engaging. Linoge could have easily been more aggressive, more sadistic, and the point would have ended uh, more or less the same. But Linoge is here on business, nothing more. Why are you wearing those? Because I choose to. Directed by Craig R. Baxley, who did some solid action with I Come In Peace, Stone Cold, and Action Jackson. How do you like your ribs? He brings more of a muted yet tense and stylistic approach. The man knows how to compose a shot. And Storm of the Century, despite its limitations, has that cinematic look and feel. Shots like the people disappearing while watching the lighthouse fall. The top-down lighthouse shot. To a simple and beautiful wide of Linoge entering the town hall. And nothing too out of the box, but it fits the story and setting well. Now, there are issues, of course. Uh, again, we were still in the early days of wide and accessible CGI. And yeah, it looks a bit rough. The cane is cheesy and something that may have worked better either cut out or never shown in motion. Even back then, it, it never really worked. You know, the demon teeth. I mean, nobody's looking at you, Linoge. Why are you doing this? For the wall? I mean, I, you know, again, one of those things that might sound cool on paper, but man, in execution, I just cut it. And the hacky main accent that comes and goes depending on the take used. Though, I will admit, and I've said this in previous videos and I will say it here, I also love a hacky Stephen King main accent, so I guess this one's a draw. Calm down. Stop acting like mainlanders. No. Oh, be smart, Mike Henderson. Mrs. Kingsbury, you look after him. Give him a hot tea, or better yet, give him some whiskey. And with any story set around a hard choice, I like to think that Storm of the Century isn't as cut and dry as some would believe. Is Linoge pure evil? I don't think so. And he's not good, but as a being who's lived many lifetimes and has seen things we couldn't comprehend. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. His indifference to human life seems at least somewhat understandable. I mean, how much thought do you give to the housefly? Something living with what seems to it as a lifetime. As he says, he wants to pass on his knowledge. Evil, soul-sucking knowledge? Uh, doubtful. This thing has lived and learned things we could never. And though this means he may not be what we consider good, there is definitely more gray here than you'd want to believe. Little Toll Island is a small seaside island. It's a small religious community. Mike assumes it to be Legion, but uh, maybe not. Hell, Linoge may not even be his real name. And though a simple religious explanation may suffice, the main religious figure, the priest, is a pedophile. Eleven and nine they are. Cute little blondes. He likes them a lot. And something this ancient must fit into that narrative. But however you interpret Linoge, we can agree that this is one of the best endings for the medium. A child willfully given. If not, all will die. And after what we've seen, it is clear Linoge has the power to do so. What would you do? She rolled the dice and lost, but the dice had to be rolled. And if you're with Mike, I can agree that sometimes the moral high ground might be the best. And in true King fashion, we had a soulful ending where some couldn't live with the choice. Others moved on and the town and its people were never the same. They were changed by the storm of the century. And what a beautiful epilogue. 
Mike has lived an entire life after the island, found a new home, got an education, and has moved on, only to see his son. And what greater ending line than a man who, in his heart, still loves Molly somewhere deep down, knows that to relay this information would do nothing but add to the pain. Only like most of us in our darkest hour, we know that one must hold steady and not lead with the heart. Because in daylight, we know better. This is a cash and carry world. Pay as you go. Sometimes you only have to pay a little. Mostly, it's a lot. But once in a while, it's all you have. Give me what I want.